Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is Chapter 1, Part 2. A Critique of Hegel's Dialectic. Hegel's ambition coincides with that of philosophy, with the most secret desire of the life of the mind, seen as expansion and dominion. To exclude nothing, to leave nothing outside itself, to abandon and transcend every one-sided position. It is linked with that fundamental appetite for being which must be maintained, cleansed if possible from magic, i.e. from illusion. Hegelianism asserts implicitly that all conflicts can be resolved without mutilation or renunciation in an expansion of being. It asserts that in the life of mind, there is no need for options, alternatives or sacrifices. Innumerable conflicts are objectively experienced, but none of them lasts forever. Every contradiction can be transcended in a forward leap of mind. Hegelianism remains, therefore, the only road a spiritual optimism or dynamism can take if it is to be formulated. Just as much as a doctrine and a logical method, Hegelianism represents a type of spiritual life that is still valid. Not to aim at a quiesing too hastily to ourselves or to the world, not to hide from ourselves the contradictions in the world, in man and in each individual, but on the contrary, to accentuate them, however much we may suffer, because it is fruitful to be torn asunder and because once the contradictions have become unbearable, the need to transcend, <clears throat> to transcend them becomes stronger than any resistance on the part of the elements that are passing away. Such is the principle of a spiritual life both sorrowful and joyous, wholly rational and unconfused. It says yes to the world, but not just yes in some blind ecstasy. It also says no and rejects what reveals itself to be sterile or moribund. Hegel knew that the conflict and division within modern man are not an invention of the philosophers. As he shows at the beginning of his aesthetic, Modern culture forces man to live in two worlds, which contradict one another. On the one hand, we see man living in the ordinary, temporal actuality of this world, weighed down by want and wretchedness, enthralled to matter. On the other hand, he can raise himself up to ideas, to a kingdom of thought and of freedom. Inasmuch as he is will, he gives himself laws. But even as he does so, he strips the world of its living actuality and resolves it into abstractions. Thus, flesh and spirit, everyday reality and thought, real necessity and ideal freedom, actual servitude and the theoretical power of the intelligence, the wretchedness of concrete existence and the splendid but fictive sovereignty of the idea, all are in conflict. For the past hundred years, this unhappy cleavage of the modern consciousness has done nothing, but grow more acute until it is now intolerable. Yet did Hegel really grasp the entire content of human experience? Did he grasp it in its authentic movement? Did he really set out from the content and extract the form from it without falsifying it? Did he really raise all the degrees and profundity of the content to thought without subordinating it to a preconceived form and without turning back to the content as immediately given? In the first place, Hegelianism, being a system, involves one essential presupposition, whereas it claims not to admit any presuppositions at all. Is it conceivable that the limited mind of an individual, a philosopher, of a philosopher, should be able to grasp the entire content of human experience? If this content is, as Hegel says it is, infinitely rich, such a richness or superabundance being alone worthy of mind, his claim can no longer be upheld. The content will be attained only through the joint efforts of many thinking individuals in a progressive expansion of consciousness. Hegel's own claim encloses and limits the content and makes it unworthy of mind. To enclose the content of art within a series of aesthetic definitions reduces it to an abstract form. In point of fact, in every great work of art, each age and each individual grasps a new content, a new aspect of it, which surprises us. Only thus can the work of art be a unity of the finite and the infinite, 
an infinite both determinate and alive. The content develops, it becomes richer and more profound. Mind's life of discovery and creation did not come to an end with Hegel. With Nietzsche, for example, Greek art appeared in a new perspective. We have continued to explore nature, life, and human beings. Fresh conflicts have appeared. <clears throat> fresh contents and fresh problems, which cannot be solved in advance. Other topics, other social and spiritual groups are asking to be raised to the level of the spiritual life and of the idea to be uprooted in principle and in practice from immediacy and necessity. Does not nature, which is life as given to us, spontaneously provide us with a content in itself infinitely rich? Hegel's speculative attitude is in a particularly awkward position vis-a-vis -vis this content. It seeks to exhaust and define it and introduce it into absolute knowledge, that is, into the Hegelian metaphysic. For him, the starry heavens are no more marvelous than an eruption of the skin. Error and evil are to be preferred to the regular trajectories of the heavenly bodies, or the innocence of plants, because error and evil are evidence of the existence of mind. In relation to the idea, the luxuriance of nature, its ambivalence, its fatality, its fantasy, and its incessant generation of new and aberrant types are merely a form of impotence. Nature is abstract and does not attain to true existence. If Hegelianism has been able to attain and define the entire content, what would have, what would have been left for autonomous art and science, for future ages, and for action? Inasmuch as it is a finished system, Hegelianism leads, like traditional formalism, to a sharp conflict between invention and knowledge, between fruitfulness and rigor. Action has specific laws, whether it be a relapse from contemplation and the inner life, or, which is more likely, a fertilization of the mind through contact with the outside world, or alternatively, a distinct essence parallel with thought and juxtaposed with other essences, their unity being transcendent. Whatever the case, action is a reality. It forms part of that given existence from which the magical mind which claims to grasp and arrest the world may well emerge in order to hurl itself into the void, but which it can transcend only illusorily. Action is a reality. The understanding says, in order to take to the water, we must first know how to swim. Action resolves vicious circles or the contradictions of static thought. Practice is creative. It cannot be deduced from the concept. It has its own exi exigencies, its own discipline, its own logic, perhaps. Since Hegel's time, the problem of action and practice has imposed itself on philosophy, which has attempted to define the specific categories of action and has sometimes even turned action against thought by striving to conceive of a pure action, action which is nothing but action. In this way, it has applied the understanding and formalism to the new problem of action. True, Hegel did give, it, give action a part to play. He saw the absolute idea as a unity of practice and knowledge of the creative activity and thought. Mind transcends the immediate. It modifies the objects, transforming and and assimilating it. Action imitates the mind whenever one eats an item of food, for example. Hegel's mind feeds off the world and devours it, causing it to disappear. But Hegel did not elucidate action in itself inasmuch as it comes up against an object which it cannot cause to disappear, more or less spiritually. Hegel did not develop Kant's analysis of the specifically practical reason. He determined a concept of action and confused action with the thought of action. But if action has its own laws and content, how is its domain to be limited? Action proclaims itself. M. Anfeg war dit hat. Rational thought, then, has got to be rescued, just as Hegel tried to rescue logic by transcending it. Hegel was not content merely to deepen the content and had made it explicit in order to attain the form. He reduced it to thought by claiming to grasp it totally and exhaust it. He insists on the rigorously and definitively determinate form which the content acquires in Hegelianism. All the determinations must be linked together in order to become intelligible. 
as far <clears throat> as far as Hegel is concerned, these connections are not discovered gradually or obtained by an experimental method. They are fixed. The sum of them, the totality, forms a circle. Philosophy forms a circle. Whatever philosophy begins with is immediately relative. It must appear as a result from a different terminal point. Any other philosophy is simply a subjective feeling <clears throat> and contingent in relation to the content. Only a perfect systematization can guarantee the possession of the entire content and turn philosophy into a science. Truth ceases to be thought of as the unity of the form and the content, but is defined by the agreement of the form with itself, by its internal coherence, by the formal identity of thought. And spiritual freedom is not defined as a taking possession of the content through a becoming aware, but is determined as a setting free of mind in relation to the content as such. Experience life or action by means of the notion and the idea. The form, therefore, is not criticized in terms of the content or derived from making the latter explicit. It is posited in terms of the ex exigencies of formal rigor and the necessities of philosophical systematization. Having asserted the primacy of the content, Hegel declares that logical thoughts are not moments exclusive in relation to those thoughts because they are the absolute foundation of all things. Thought is thus the secret source of the content. It is only an illusion that mind receives its content from outside in accordance with the unphilosophical presuppositions of, ob of observation and experience. Nature appears to be the presupposition of mind only up until that moment when the supreme truth, the idea, is determined. Nature disappears into this truth. The movement of thought is only a turning back on itself. The internal birth or becoming of substance is a passing over into the external. Inversely, the becoming of determinate being is the internal essence taking hold of itself once again. The content allows itself to be shut up in this enclosed circular system only because it was itself the emanation of the mind that posited this form. The whole may be compared to a circle containing other circles, in such a way that the system of these particular elements forms the totality of the idea. It is no longer a matter of raising the content freely to the notion, but of finding in the content a certain form of the notion, posited a priori in relation to the content. Circular, enclosed, and total in a special sense of that word, to wit as a closed totality. Thought grasps only itself. All the thinking subject does is to witness this development of the idea. The interesting thing for the other sciences is to recover the forms of logic. And science contains thought in as much as thought is the thing itself. Or in other words, the thing in itself in as much as it is pure thought. The subject matter of cognition or content is thus determined by the form. More generally, Hegel's dialectical logic can be interpreted in several ways, or rather two or even three different movements of thought can be found in it. A, the dialectic is seen as an analysis of the movement. The method assumes the content. It breaks up the unity of the becoming only to recover it again later. Ultimately, after an infinite analysis, the movement of thought coincides with the spontaneous movement of the world and the content b instead of expressing and reflecting the movement of the content the dialectic produces this movement it is not so much a method of analysis as a method of synthetic and systematic construction of the content c the dialectic is seen as resulting from the alienation of the idea at the point where it starts is to be found the potentiality of the idea which emerges from itself divides becomes other and produces the dialectic each of these interpretations can be supported from what Hegel wrote, but it would seem that the second one is the most authentically Hegelian. The phenomenology itself, which lays so much stress on the content of consciousness and on alienation and the externalization of mind in the world of things, states that the content defined more precisely is mind, 
which reviews itself and reviews itself in as much as it is mind. And the final chapter of the greater logic comes to the conclusion that the method is the absolute, unique, supreme, and infinite force, which no object will be able to resist. The method is at once soul and substance, or more clearly still, the logical idea is its own content in as much as it is an infinite form. The absolute idea released for itself has been made manifest by the fact that, in itself, the determination no longer takes the form of a content, but simply of a form. It transcends its positing as a content. In the absolute idea, logic recovers the simple unity of the starting point by virtue of the mediation and of the transcending of this mediation. Immediate being has become an idea which has achieved identity with itself. The method is the pure concept related only to itself. It is therefore that simple relation to self which is being. The concept no longer appears as external to the content which it had been in subjective reflection. In absolute knowledge, the concept has become its own content. The absolute idea becomes a beginning for other spheres and other sciences, those of nature and history. Absolute knowledge, therefore, instead of being the final term and end of thought, can be taken as a starting point. Starting from the idea, we can reconstruct the world. It is not certain whether these three interpretations or dialectical movements are compatible. The theory of alienation becomes oddly blurred in the greater logic. Hegel wants to show that the idea, positing itself as a unity of the concept and reality, is absorbed into the immediacy of being becomes nature, although it does not cease to be itself, simple, transparent, and free. The transition must be understood in the sense that the idea lets go of itself freely, absolutely sure of itself, and resting in itself. Thus the idea is nothing more than infinite rest, and as it says in the last paragraph of the lesser logic, which elsewhere lays so much stress on the content, the idea resolves to deliver itself freely of the moment of its particularity, of the first determination of the other being. It is rather curious to compare these passages with those, especially in the phenomenology, or even in the logics, which express the profound and disruptive activity of infinite negativity, subjectivity, freedom, and the transcending. Insofar as it is a subject, the living substance is pure and simple negativity, a process which divides the simple, duplicates the terms and sets them in opposition to each other, says the phenomenology. Hegel does not prove that this calm externalization of the idea releases contradictory existences and not juxtaposed existences or essences, quite simply external one to another. On the contrary, he accepts religion, law, and art to be distinct domains, contradictory neither amongst themselves nor with philosophy, and hence simply juxtaposed. Religion and philosophy have a common content, and this content is subtracted from the development, from succession in time. By believing that it can grasp the whole content, Hegelianism limits the content it can accept, accepts this uncritically, and finally subtracts it from the dialectical becoming in which case the dialectical contradiction exists only for and through the finite individual mind. Sometimes Hegel posits absolute motionless being, eternal self-knowledge, an objective identity which abolishes all contradiction forever. The philosopher participates in this absolute knowledge and extracts the entire world from out of its head. The form of identity The form of identity gives birth to the content. This system is built up like a piece of rigid architecture made up of superimposed triangles suspended by their apices. apices. Then perhaps Hegel feels being starting to shudder and elude him, so he posits a substance even stranger and more alien than being, negativity. The positive or determination is itself a negation and a participation in the negativity, which is the soul, the turning point in the movement of the concept, the mighty power of thought, which destroys and transcends negativity, which in as much as it is, which in as much as it is an infinite power identical with itself, 
is a hypostatized negation, thus acquires a transcendent existence. It is an absolute nothingness of which the positive is no more than a momentary manifestation, instantly suppressed. It is an active nothingness, a mystical and omnipresent abyss, from which all the forces of life and matter tumble like mysterious cataracts, before falling back into it again. Negativity is infinite and cruel, and Hegelianism becomes a subjective mysticism. It might be thought of as something constructed by the internal tempo of mind, moving within the eternal present, or else, as Heidegger puts it, as an attempt at the analysis of the ontological structure of death. The, object, the objective content vanishes. Hegelian speculation is still steeped in magical ideas. By positing a magical participation in absolute being, conceived of as knowledge and reason, it combines the magical schema with an attempt to be more fully rational. At the same time, it is a first metaphysic of nothingness. It oscillates between absolute object and absolute subject, between being and nothingness, between knowledge and a magical mysticism. Hegel's system, inasmuch it is, is as <laughs> inasmuch as it is a system, abolishes both contradiction and the becoming. Contradiction is redu reduced to a logical essence, a relation determinable a priori, which the mind automatically meets within every single thing. It is only an approximation to the truth relative to the positions adopted by our finite understanding. Being no longer attached to the spontaneous, given movement of thoughts content, it loses its objectivity. What we have is no longer the concrete unity of specific contradictions, but an absolute identity, being or nothingness posited in advance for all eternity. But contradiction does not allow itself to be destroyed by Hegel any more than by the pure logicians. It takes an ironic revenge on him. Hegelianism sought to put an end to the becoming by seeing it as a becoming and enclosing it quietly in a circle. But it is an illusion to see the becoming as a quiet circle, as a resting place for thought within itself, or as a fulfillment of mind. Hegel wanted to resolve and transcend all the contradictions of the world, but contradiction and even illogicality, illogicality remained inside his own system. By making it eternal, he mobilizes the reality he claims to be reconstruction, reconstructing, and it is the reality of his own time. With him, the metaphysical third term takes on the well-known and very unphilosophical features of the Prussian state. Yet life goes on, states crumble or are transformed. The Hegelian universe, therefore, is nothing more than the world of the metaphysician Hegel, the creature of his own speculative ambition. It is still not the world of men in all its dramatic reality. What answer does it hold for the exigencies and the urgent questions of individuals engaged in living who seek spiritual guidance and earthly salvation? Confronted by nothingness, they hesitate. They would like to fight against death and have an open future before them. Does Hegel keep his promises? The phenomenology says grandiosely, that which seems to take place independently of it, matter, and to be an activity directed against it is its own activity. An unwise promise. The world is only justified if it is my handiwork. I mean the creation of whatever is most validly human and spiritual in me. Hegel pledges himself to proving to me, a man in the world, that even that which causes me suffering is the product of the human and spiritual activity in me. He pledges himself to justify the past, the present, and the problems of the present as the preconditions for the existence and formation of my freedom. Now I do not recognize myself in the fictive drama of the idea which lets itself go in the creation of the world, is alienated and then recovers itself in the Hegelian system. Hegelianism is a dogma. It demands self-discipline, a renunciation of individual experience and the problems of individual existence. When the phenomenology describes the torment of unrealized being, I find it moving. But the cosmic adventures of mind are independent of us. Hegelianism does not have magic powers. It cannot efface or justify what causes us actual suffering or hinders us from living. We come up against the hostile forces, alien beings and tyrannies, 
It is simply an attitude of mind which makes these forces of destiny so oppressive and relentless. In order to be delivered, or is it simply an attitude of mind which makes these forces of destiny so oppressive and relentless? That's a question. In order to be delivered from hostility and oppression, or to give our consent to them, is it enough simply to become aware of them as such? Hegelianism does not provide a solution. Inasmuch as it is a system and a dogma, it reproduces within mind the limited relation between master and slave. It is nothing more than a finite object. Yet Hegel's ambition remains valid and coincides with that of philosophy. A way has been opened. Perhaps it is possible to transcend Hegelianism on its own terms from inside by starting from its own contradictions and preserving what is essential in its mode of operation. Perhaps we must accept the rich content of life in all its immensity. Nature, spontaneity, action, widely differing cultures, fresh problems. It may swamp our minds. We may have to explore it and study it in greater depth without being able to exhaust it, but we must open our minds to it. The form to which thought raises the content must be seen as fluid and capable of improvement. Thought must accept the contradictions and conflicts in the content. It must determine their transcending and their solutions in accordance with the movement of that content and not impose a priori and systematic forms on it. Little by little, the becoming will be repossessed through and through in all its prodigious wealth of moments, aspects, and elements. A transcended Hegelianism will integrate and elaborate dialectical logic in conformity with the nature of the dialectical movement itself of the becoming taken authentically as absolute experience.